there is essentially like an epidemic of loneliness. We want to、mm. change the way that people love. That right now, the way that people are trying to fall in love is broken. I mean, it's mostly dating apps, which sucks. Sex is down, and loneliness is just a pervasive issue. What if we actually addressed p- size, which is such a big issue for especially young teenage men? You are doing some of the like craziest, sh- dude. We're gonna get canceled. If Jesus lived today, oh,、uh, he'd be he, a YouTuber. You were a nonprofit well before this Jubilee channel came. What changed? Why? That's a great question. I actually haven't been asked that way.、Um, Finding the secret virgin. Men ranking themselves by the size of their eggplant. To be dating thirty people at once. If you've seen these videos, you know Jubilee, the most wholesomely spicy channel on YouTube. Now meet Jubilee CEO and founder Jason Y. Lee, who quit his six-figure job to start Jubilee as a nonprofit spreading empathy. He figured out YouTube secrets on how to go viral and developed video ideas that are both entertaining and heartfelt. Today he's focused on figuring out love and relationships by launching Jubilee's. New app Nectar that's gonna help you improve your love life. This pod is sponsored by me. I help build this cool new tool, Carrot Insights. If you're a creator, Carrot helps you manage your financials and compare how you're doing against peers. More on this later, and link in description below. Jason,、okay. thanks so much for making time today. Thanks for having me. So you're not only CEO of Jubilee Media, an empire with over. Eight million followers in your YouTube channel. Yep. You are also responsible for Jubilee hits ranging from men rank their penis sizes, correct, to <laughs> women date twenty men at once, to hey guys choose girls based on their fathers, but also blind devotion. Yeah. A film about unconditional love. Yeah. How a husband supports his wife when she goes blind. I watched Blind Devotion. I was like, I had tears in my eyes. I was like, Oh my god, this is so moving. I feel like because we've mentioned penis size, I feel like I should address that quickly. Otherwise, people like, What are what are we talking? Yeah. Everyone who's meeting for the first time is like, What what is going on? Yeah. Jason just walks around with a ruler in his pocket, like measuring guys' penis size. Yeah. So Jubilee, if you've been on YouTube, you've you've seen our content, right? You've heard of Jubilee. The most distinctive format ever.、Yeah. You walk in, completely white room, ten people. Hey, try and figure out which one of you is the biggest or the best or the most whatever. And it's a lot of reflecting what we think about in our minds, and sometimes we're afraid to say, or we wish we could say, or we know we shouldn't say, and we're asking people to say some of those things.、Mm. And why do we do that? Is it like we just want to provoke people? We just want to like light stuff on fire, and that's not the case. Our mission at Jubilee is we want to provoke understanding and create human connection. And what we found is like I started Jubilee Media in 2017, right after the presidential election. Wow! Yeah, everyone's mad at each other. Everyone's pissed at each other. 50% of the country voted for one person. 50% of the country voted for the other. I came from the Midwest, so back home I knew everyone who had voted for Trump. I lived in LA at the time, and I still do. Everyone here was like, "Why would anyone vote for Trump?" Everyone here voted for Hillary. And they're like divided, right?、Mm. I was like, "This is so bizarre because I know these two individuals are actually very similar—not Hillary and Trump, but these two folks who voted for these opposing people—and they think that they're、um, they don't feel like they can even be in the same room together."、Mm. I was like, "What if we created a media company that actually forced us to see each other as humans, create more empathy and dialogue? Could that be possible?" And that was like a Bold notion at the time that we would create a media company that was about that because people were like, that's too lofty. That's really idealistic. Oh, it's like can it be like upworthy? Upworthy, or is that like soul pancake? Or is that like Mr. Rogers? I was like, no, we're gonna make it in a way that's viral and that young people don't feel like this is broccoli. We're gonna like make them excited to watch it. Yeah, and they're like, no way. So actually, when I first started raising, I had like eighty three nos. You know, I have a list of VCs just trying to raise money for your mission. Yeah, exactly. Because they were like, "That doesn't make any sense."、And、I was like, "No, this is exactly what this generation wants and needs." And also, I think it's going to be incredibly、um, profitable. I think it's going to be really lucrative、wow. to do this. So, really quickly. So then we also have a show called Ranking, and、um, we had literally joked about for years. Oh, we should do a rank because we'll do a ranking by height. We'll do a ranking by IQ, and it's all about. Uncovering our stereotypes and our biases, right? Oh, because this person looks this way, they look like they should be、mm-hmm. lower on the IQ scale. This person looks this way, and they're higher on the IQ scale. When truthfully, this is just like a really nifty way of uncovering those stereotypes. But with penis size, 
we're like, oh, we can never do this. We can never do this. And we said that for so many years. I was like, oh, this is why we have to do this. And this is why. It's because I don't know what your experience was learning about male anatomy, but I remember having one class, one hour in sex ed where they talked about penises. And then the rest of my education was literally in the locker room yeah. and or through like porn. Yeah. So very, yeah. very unhealthy, I would say unhealthy depictions and like education. I was like, what if we actually addressed penis size, which is such a big issue for especially young teenage men that so much of our ego, so much of our like self-worth or yeah. like identity is I'm tied sensitive to around it still. There's so much Asian American stereotype sure, yeah. that Asian American men have tiny penises. Oh, absolutely. So then it's like, okay, what if we could actually talk about and unearth that, what is the way that we would do it? Oh, we should do a ranking. And what you find in the results of that ranking is pretty surprising, right? And by doing so, it's not just like, oh, let's just like all whip up our penises and like measure it. It's not, a, it's not literally a dick measuring contest. It is we're hiding the broccoli, so to speak. So that's something that we try to do with all of our content. And, you know, there's different levels of it. I'm not trying to say we're solving um, cancer through this video that's measuring penises, but I do think that young guys are watching it and maybe even ever so slightly starting to untangle their self-perception and stereotypes about, oh, because this person is this, they have this. And that's almost never the case. And that's sort of what you've done with the channel in general. You are addressing not just love, you're addressing race, where you have things like, guess who's not black out of this group of six people? Yep. You address religion. Yep. You had one with Satanists yes. confronting people from other religions. We did. Politics. Yep. Even We've had flat like, earthers. Yeah, flat earthers. Anti-vaxxers. Versus scientists, anti-vaxxers versus vaxxers. Wealth. I know Graham Stephens, a mutual friend of ours, you had him on millionaires versus minimum wage. Yeah. And so you are taking some of the most controversial topics that divide us as a species. And you're like, ooh, not only am I going to talk about this, I'm going to make it funny. Yeah. And when I look back at your channel, the oldest videos are not like this at all. It's like you in like a subway, like playing like a guitar, yeah. trying to raise money for Haiti. Yep. You were a nonprofit well before this Jubilee channel came. Again, the very first question I started with, what changed? Why? If you're a creator, Carrot just launched this new insights tool that analyzes your socials and financials to calculate how much you're making today and how much more you could be making. You can compare your earnings to that of other creators like you and see on average how much they make and how they're making it, whether it's AdSense, brand deals, merch, or courses. For this channel, I learned compared to other podcasters of similar size, I'm lagging behind in growth rate and brand deal earnings, so I know how to improve. Try for free via link in description below because Carrot's mission is to help help handle the business side of being a creator. Now back to the podcast. You were a nonprofit well before this Jubilee channel came. Again, the very first question I started with, what changed? Why? No, it's a great question. You know, you mentioned my faith and I think that that is the starting point for all of this. Um, and I grew up just believing a couple of things. One is I grew up believing that we have to love others and we have to love God. Like that was it. Mm. Right. And I thought initially the way that I would do that was by doing a nonprofit where we were telling people, Hey, this is important. Mm -hmm. Donate money. Like you should do this. You should do this. You should um, be more socially aware about this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more awareness. We need more activism. And early days of Jubilee project, the nonprofit, it was literally a 501c3 was all about that. And still we made amazing content that went mm. viral. Some of our very biggest videos, like Blind Devotion had like 20 or 30 million yeah, views on YouTube. Love language too, about a man and woman communicating via notes and he found out she's deaf. Yes. Exactly. Such a beautiful time or season because I think it, that's when I started to realize, oh, there's something here. People want to watch some of this content. But then I started to get, I think, frustrated or like disenfranchised because I felt like I was just telling people this is important do this mm. and slowly uh, you can you only have so much attention where you're like i just felt like i was like preaching at people essentially i'm like a teacher saying hey do this do that do that or like raise money for this raise money for this and then people just start like paying attention less and less and it became very like emotionally very tiresome for me maybe the way to do the most good is actually not necessarily by force feeding broccoli what if we could hide the broccoli mm. 
and actually make it so that they're running, they're lining up for this. And by the way, there's broccoli in there. Of course. And, you know, I, I talk about my faith and I looked at, you know, whatever your beliefs about religion is like Jesus talks in parables, right? Yeah. And he talks in like stories. And it's because that's way more accessible or interesting than like, go do this, go yeah, do be that. Be nice to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it wasn't that I became less interested in doing good. It was, oh, we actually might do way more good if we change the culture. In it, a way, this is going to be a hot take. Yeah. If Jesus lived today. Oh, he'd be he, a YouTuber. Be on YouTube. Yeah. He would be on Instagram. He would be making TikTok clips because as you said in the Bible, he already speaks in parables and stories. Well, it's about meeting people where they're at, mm. right? It's about making things that are accessible to everyone and that people are interested in leaning into. And in the YouTube age, that could be a round table between Satanists and folks of other religions. Here's the thing is like when we first started doing, you know, all sorts of issues, we did, we've done um, incarcerated folks, like convicted felons and yeah. cops. We've done flat earthers and round earthers. We've done anti-vax and vax. There almost every time we've done a very controversial or difficult topic, there is backlash we'll get. Yes. Jason, why are you guys platforming uh, flat earthers? Why are you putting them on the same stage as round earthers? Correct. Also known as most normal most, people. Most, most individuals. I am a round earther. I <laughs> yeah. will confess. I'm not going to disclose my belief system, but sure. I also believe in, yeah. Um, but what I found is, you know what, if, if what is and there's obviously some safeguard railings here, like we're not going to feature folks who are like advocating um, killing or pain or something like hateful. If all of the beliefs that we show or points of view that we show only are according to my line of thinking or anyone in our company's line of thinking, we become the same as every other media company. Literally, we become a biased liberal, conservative, Asian, whatever it is. It's just through that narrow it's lens. It's just Jason's worldview. Yeah. And then why is that additive? I actually found that I needed to be confronted with a lot of my own stereotypes of like, well, sh I believe the world is the world is round and I think it would be very difficult to convince me otherwise. But if we're actually not trying to convince people that the world is round or that it's flat, but rather that we all deserve empathy and dialogue, Wow. I need to listen to this flat earther. How did this person come to believe this? When I meet you, yeah. you are a very humble, soft-spoken individual, at least in the context where I've met you. Okay. And you are doing some of the like craziest shit out there on YouTube, man. We are, yeah. <laughs> that you are, anyone would get so much hate for. And now I understand a little bit more. I've always wondered like- <laughs> Why do we do this? Not only why you do this, but for what you do, Jubilee is a loved and trusted brand despite going out and doing some of this crazy shit. And now I understand because it comes from your willingness to tolerate cognitive dissonance yeah. and the security to examine your own beliefs. You are okay <laughs> putting people in a video that you don't agree with because you're just like, I want to learn and I want to figure out how can we all love each other more. I think we have to because we are in a state of the world where we are so unfortunately it feels more polarized more divided yeah that unless we do this i feel like we are like doomed we are like headed on two different trains fragmenting yeah and it's so terrible and what i see from our audience and i see from young people frankly is that they don't want that they actually have the ability to see nuance and understand different perspectives we had this huge debate you know four years ago we went to um the middle east we went to jerusalem to film israelis and palestinians again Anyone with that video idea would be like, we are going to die tomorrow. Yeah. And then once the conflict came about again, we said, we have to revisit this. We did a middle ground. We did another one. And we said, dude, we're going to get canceled. We're going to get canceled. By whom? Both sides. These folks are going to cancel us and these folks are going to cancel us. And I said, you know what? And this is kind of my belief system is if we get equal amount of canceling from both sides, that would be great because that means that we've done it in a way that um, doesn't feel biased or skewed one way or another, but rather that people recognize that this is a space where we're not fro for A or for B, that we are for empathy and for humans. It's really interesting on YouTube, you're probably noticing or you're seeing a lot of like copycats, a lot of people imitating or mimicking or so literally uh, copying our, our formats, like um, shot for shot even. And one thing that I think allows us to continue to have the brand loyalty or recognition is that people know why we're doing this. 
a lot of people don't know who I am. It's not, we're not doing this because I want to be famous. We're doing this because we really believe, our entire team fully believes that we want to provoke understanding, and create human connection, full stop. And I think that that's why, luckily, no one has like burned our office down yet, you know? People who want to be famous. Yeah. Really... And I know this because there are parts of me, I'm like, oh, I like to be known. Yeah. One of my biggest fears is, oh my God, what if people don't like me? What if people hate me? Yeah. And so when now I look at Jubilee and the media company, the nonprofit, you're going to do this even if you get hate. I mean, I love how you're like, look, it's fine if I get hate. Just give me equal amounts of hate yeah. from each side. I'm more bothered if it's all one side because then I'm like, damn. And by the was way- Was I biased? Yeah. And we've missed the mark before. Mm. And we have to be accountable to that because we're all humans too. So right. we're tr we're constantly trying to check ourselves and say- well, are are we mischaracterizing this? Because we have a tremendous amount of um, power and people trust us with their stories and their depictions and their identities. And we've definitely effed up before. So it is something we think a lot about, but yeah. Sorry. But just, just the fact, no, that's what I'm saying. That mission is why you're able to be genuine in a way that these copycats can't. Because if they're copying you, they're doing it for clicks and clout and views. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing it because there's a broader reason underneath. You've said you have brought on perspectives that you haven't agreed with. I'm curious, when was like the first time when you were like, I actually don't agree with this <laughs> at all, but I guess let's put them on air. I'm willing to share these things because I want us to all recognize we all have shortcomings and stereotypes. Yeah. I think the first time I really remember distinctly that you know, I grew up in a very conservative Midwestern yeah. household. Kansas. Kansas. I'm from Indiana. Yeah. So, you know. Yes. Bible Bell, XYZ. I think one of our directors really wanted to do an episode, and this was like six or this was like six years ago, about um, throuples and polyamory. And I was like, oh, and it was kind of like, we want to show all the different types of relationships. So we're going to do like same sex. We were going to do interracial, we're going to do whatever, all these different things. And he was like, oh, we really have to include a throuple or polyamorous relationship. And I was like, oh, I don't think we need to. That's not that big. And like, do we really need, you know, like it kind of went beyond my comfort level mm. of where I was like, well, this is the room for relationships the way that I define it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds like it's such a small thing now, but at the time I was like, oh shit, Jason, you're getting confronted and punched in the face by this idea of, Ooh. are you willing and able to, you know, feature folks that don't necessarily meet initially your paradigm? And now I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I've got no problems with it. But at the time I was like, oh, huh, I've got some learning to do here. You mentioned, yes, I agree. So much of the voice that you've built is dependent on you, Jason, not letting your individual philosophies necessarily color them. I will say though, there is one philosophy from yours that clearly is permeated throughout, but it's a good thing. It's one of tolerance. Yeah. There's a belief that in a pluralistic society where everyone has their own goals and ends, everyone can go do what they want as long as it's not harming other people. However, everyone needs to agree at least to tolerate each other. There's a saying hey, we tolerate everybody except the anti-tolerant. Yeah. Huh. Because that breaks the fabric that holds it all together. And so when I look at your work, no, there's a very particular part of Jason there, which is a willingness to engage with people. You've even taken it one step further that is saying you do tolerate some of the not tolerant to give them a chance to come and speak. Yeah, that's something that we, man, our casting team is amazing. Like, yeah. Think about how difficult of a job that would be at Jubilee, where one day you're looking for a, whatever, a priest, and the next day you're looking for a convicted felon. Um, and we need them to be willing to come on set and share very openly about their deepest secrets or their biggest traumas. It's tremendously difficult, and it's crazy what we ask people to do. Mm. The one thing that we do ask everyone, though, yeah. is if you are going to come to the table, you can't flip over this table. That is actually a rule that we have. So everyone has a seat at the table. So Eric, you would have a seat at our table and you're always welcome there. But if you're going to sit and you're going to flip over the table, or you're going to throw food and try to throw your knife at someone at the table, like we're not going to allow that actually. And we'll actually ask you to leave. So while we are very, very tolerant and we do believe that everyone should have a voice at the table, mm. our uh, generosity or a grace doesn't extend to allow for whether it's like lack of safety on set, a lack of like, 
you know, we even try to think about like emotional trauma, things like that, having folks around set who can help support that too. You're almost bringing people in and saying, hey, like, do you want a chance to share your voice and feel understood? Innately human desire in all of us. But in return, you need to conform to a common set of languages and yeah. roles and how we talk with each other. Yeah, exactly. One of the most beautiful things that viewers don't get to see from our content is the majority of the time, I'd say like 90% of the time, the cast, when they're stepping off set, they're usually going to grab a beer or grabbing a meal or like staying in touch. Like the amount of times that you're like, wait, what What just happened here? Like even Israeli-Palestine, right? You watch the end of that video and they're like chatting, they're talking, they're like, let's stay connected. I really don't agree with you. I vehemently disagree with you, but I can understand why you would feel that way. And that is something... How rare is that that we see that right now? I mean, I love that. Yeah. I have to ask, the 10% of the time that doesn't happen, how do you feel? What happens? Uh, usually it's just quiet. <laughs> <laughs> just like, well, this has been fun. Cool. Yep. I'm going to go Goodbye. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to allow people to go on their journey in their individual way. You also mentioned, too, that when you bring these people together, you're coming from a place where it's beyond your own personal POVs. For you yourself, that mission, you said love, love of God, love of others. So I grew up not religious. And in college, the first time I ever went to a sermon was because I was really depressed. I was really struggling. Mm. And I remember in that sermon, the craziest concept that has still stayed with me was actually one of grace, mm. which is love given to you, even though you might not deserve it yeah craziest concept ever i'm curious for yourself when you grew up in this religious background did did you feel loved wow truthfully that might be one of like the only places i truly felt loved mm. and I, I don't mean to say my parents are awesome i love my parents yeah um but they were also immigrant parents who were trying to make ends meet and trying to survive in a country where they didn't speak the language. I think, you know, that you've, you've kind of really astutely talked about this idea of grace and a lot of what we do at Jubilee. So often it's kind of like, man, I would never share this deep, deep, deep secret about myself or the shitty thing that I've done with you or with other people, because if they knew that, oh, they would not like me. They would hate me. They would cancel me. They would um, be ashamed of me, all these things. And what I've just learned through the content that we make is we all carry those secrets. And you're like, oh shit, right? We have a show that we used to do called Seeking Secrets where people would just share their biggest secrets. And the number of times that other people would say, wait a second, I actually feel I did, that's the same as mine. And it's like, whoa, what makes us more connected is not like our triumphs, like, Look at you, you got into a great school, I got into a great school. Or look at you, you made a million dollars, I also made a million dollars. It's actually, oh shit, I'm going through this thing or I did this thing, I'm really ashamed. It's like, no, I know what that feels like because I went through this thing as well. Or I just got broken up with, like, dude, I know what it feels like to, to be broken up with. And I think that at the end of the day, all we as individuals really want is we want to be fully known, mm. but also fully loved. And how... um rare is that like where do you find that we can find fully known but we see that in a lot of in the creator space i'm going to become a famous youtuber i'm going to become a famous tiktoker or whatever a huge social media following but often even that is a curation of a personality or a certain side of myself or an act that you start to play so a lot of people get burned out by that because they're like well that's not really me and it's like if they knew who i really was they might not really like me and then um, fully love, that's like really grace. Because if everyone knew everything about me, all the shitty things about me, but still loved me, oh, then I can extend that grace to other people too. But it is this like cycle of grace that I think we're looking for that we don't often see. That's what I was going to say. We have a nine month old now. I haven't really reflected on this, but I think that that is fully like rounded out my understanding of grace. Because truthfully, even for my favorite person in the world, my wife, I'm like, oh, would I go to jail for murder for her instead of her? I'm like, I don't know. I, I would have to think about that quite a bit. But for my son, my daughter, my kid, I'm like, oh, I would. Wow. Yeah. And I don't think I understood that. And I'm like, wow, that is insanity. 
But that is, I think, what unconditional love looks like. And by the way, if he came to me and said, oh my God, I did this terrible thing, I I would not be proud. I wouldn't be excited about it, but I would be like, I still love you. Like, that's not going to change my love for you. That's crazy. That's um, unconditional. I think you're hitting on the social media version of this is, Jason, would you would you like me if I were a worm? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think the problem right now with social is like, well, so much of our identity is tied now as creators to numbers. Mm -hmm. Oh, my channel is blowing up. I got a million subscribers now. And every video is getting a million views. Man, people must really like me then. Mm. And we conflate those two things. Like my identity is my work or my identity is the response I get. And that simply isn't the case. And it's really devastating also when a couple of years from now, if let's say your videos are not getting a million views, what if they're only getting 10,000 views now? Does that mean that you are less yeah, great of a person? Yeah. But that's why I think there's so many, like if you think about the life cycle of a creator on YouTube or in social, like what is the longest we've seen? Like there's very rare to see people spend decades, let alone more than three or four years. Like a burning out process is very common for that reason. How do you handle that? Because I literally started this by saying you have over 8 million subscribers. Your new app, Nectar, has gone over a million downloads in three months. All these yeah. numbers. How much validation do you attach to that? I think I am lucky I should say either I'm lucky or I was very intentional that mm. a lot of people who watch Jubilee have no idea who I am. Yes. So I can like walk in the middle of Century City Mall in the middle of Times Square and literally if you've seen my content or Jubilee's content, you have no idea who I am. And that is something I find really nice and is really special because it's not actually about me. I've built the company in a way that like if I go get hit by a bus this afternoon, frankly, Jubilee should be fine. Mm. And that's because it's it's not the Jason Lee show. It is Jubilee. And uh, by the way, we have an incredible team of people who are more brilliant than I am who are doing all these things mm -hmm. too. So I think that that's the difference. And I think that that was something, you know, in Jubilee Project Days, I was like in a lot of our content. So yeah, it was you would, playing for people to donate to Haiti. Yeah. And that was fun. And it was exhilarating because you get attention and you get people saying, oh, you're a good person. You're doing this great yeah. thing. It's so alluring because you're like, oh, this is pretty nice. It's like, oh, this candy tastes so good. Um, and then the more you get it, the more you get, it's like, it's like an, almost an addiction, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of validation. Um, but I also saw in the space, so many other creators who were burning out. I was like, oh, wow. clearly this is like eating candy for years. And it's not sustenance. Um, and if I want to build something that actually makes a difference, we need to build something that can be long lasting, that can last decades. So that's why I decided to, you know, let's call it Jubilee. When we started Jubilee Media, let's call it Jubilee. I'm not going to be in all our videos. I'm not going to be the face of it. You're not going to see me reacting to stuff. Like I will do it, but it's not going to be about Jason Wiley. It's going to be about Jubilee. So then where does the sustenance come from? I think that's the beautiful thing about faith no matter what God or religion or faith you prescribe mm -hmm. to is that I think that there's always a chasm for me between me as a human and like what we should aim for. Mm. God or Jesus for me is the embodiment of that like full grace mm. or that's what I'm trying to close that gap of like, Oh man, I wish I could love people more. Wow. And what if I could love everyone as much as I love my son or my wife even. Mm. Like that would make the world better if everyone treated that each other that way and it's going to be impossible to do. With Jubilee, we're talking about what would the world look like if we just listened to one another? Mm. Don't even change your point of view. What if you actually just took the moment to say, ah, man, I really hate this point of view, but let me listen to it. Because I, I don't think we're doing that right now. And I think that's making our society a lot worse. A lot of folks, when they have such a big mission, their personal relationships aren't quite the same. It's like, I'm so focused on love for the people. And it's like, well, did, did he love his own family? And yeah. so I think my question for you is, first of all, how, how did you meet your wife? And second, how did that develop in the context of like, like, honey, I have a mission to the Oops. 320 million people in the U.S. and the billions of people beyond. And balancing that with your own conception of, like, what did love between you and her look like? I would think I would characterize myself as a romantic. I don't know if it's hopeless, but I think I very much, I love love stories. I love mm -hmm. love. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the space. Um, and the way that Mel and I met, she was formerly a news anchor. So she was a journalist for Yahoo Finance. And I literally was on Facebook and I was scrolling and then there was a video that popped up of an interview that was being done with a financial startup CEO and this reporter. And I was like, oh, she's pretty. So I clicked on it. And I was like, oh, she's brilliant. And I watched and I was like, oh, interesting. And the way that the algorithm worked at the time where maybe God or the algorithm or Mark Zuckerberg, whatever that was, every day that I went to Facebook that week, literally, I kid you not, the same video popped up. And each time I was like, oh, I guess I should watch this again. I don't know why. And then, you know, at the bottom third, like Melody's name would come up, Melody Hum. I was like, okay, let me just Google her real quick. So I found her on Twitter. And I found that she's Korean American. I found that she's like, you know, really well traveled and just like has interesting thoughts. And I was like, oh, she's pretty funny. And um, I was like, oh, she's kind of cool. Let me just reach out to her. Not thinking like, let me slide in her DMs. It was just like, a, hey, big fan of your work. She was like, oh, cool, thank you. And we became friends on Twitter. And then um, she was in New York at the time I was in LA. I was in New York for a wedding and I actually slid into her DM then and said, hey, would you want to grab coffee? Oh, so that's when the intentionality That's when it was more. like, ah, yes. Ooh. Now we're in the same city for this brief time. Let's let's hang out and let's see, let's see if there's anything here. Why for me. She, why did she take that DM from her side? Like <laughs> rando guy literally is like, you know, in a very polite way being like, yeah, that interview you did, you, you, you were, you were great. I don't know you, but from the five second clip and then he's like, Hey, by the way, we should meet for coffee. Yeah. You'll have to ask her that, but she'll probably say that, um, she thought I was harmless. Like she thought that this was just going to be like this networking coffee and, I'd like to say it was just my charm and the riz just in the moment that won her over. This but is a uh, man on a mission of love. How can you not appreciate that? And it was crazy because we lived across the country from each other. Mm. And um, I think neither of us really wanted to do long distance. But there was something I really felt that was special with her was, one, you kind of ask like, oh, this whole thing about Jubilee. She wasn't really, she wasn't familiar with Jubilee at all. Mm. She didn't know what Jubilee was. And I hadn't started Jubilee Media yet. So I had, this is Jubilee, Project, Jubilee Project, a nonprofit. A nonprofit. We were getting millions of views, but it wasn't the new mission. So I, I actually really liked that she wasn't a fan. I didn't, I liked that she kind of was like, oh, cool. And like, yeah, because there were so many, for you. I, I would think so. But because there were other people who were like, hey, big fan of Jubilee, which was awesome. But for some reason that like, I don't know if it made me think of them differently, but it put them into a different box, which was like, oh, this is a fan and this is not a partner. And that was probably unfair at the time, but I was really intent on finding a partner in life. And what I mean by partner is, you know, my parents have been married for probably 40 years. And what I love about their relationship is that they're both professors. They like commute to work together. I've just seen in my life always a model, which is like 50-50. And if anything, my mom is like much more dedicated to her work and her career and more successful in some ways. Um, so I was like, oh, that's what yeah. true love looks like. It's built on partnership and respect and find someone who will challenge you and call you out on your bullshit. So I didn't want a fan that was going to be like, Jason. I love what you do. You're amazing and you're so special mm. because that sounds awesome. But I was like, ah, but then I just, I, I think I would just... Like the allure of that conditionality. Like, what if I stop making good videos? Yeah, and also what if uh, this person just, you know, they, they don't, they're not going to make me better. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. I want someone who will challenge me to grow me and make me a better partner and make me all those things. So, um, yeah, I think that that was all part of this, this kind of journey. You were me. already in a mental space. You were looking for someone. You know, I had had my time where I was like having a good time and meeting all these wonderful people and, uh, you know, just like making relationships and yeah. having fun. And I think I was at a place in my life where I was looking for, yeah, life partner. You had great role models in your parents. How secure did you feel in terms of your attachment style and how you felt about love? I think I really respect them a lot. Mm. because their relationship is not the most affectionate type, but there's so much uh, trust and respect. Yeah. And I just grew up seeing that. And I just was like, oh, that's a, that's, I guess that's what marriage is. Like, I'd like to believe I'm a secure attachment style. I don't yeah. know. Um, but I desperately wanted that in my life too. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, it's funny because sometimes people ask me like, how did you know that you want to get married? How did you know you want to have kids? Mm. And I kid you not, when I was a kid, it, uh, more than my career 
the, the the thing I knew I really wanted to be when I grew up was I wanted to be a husband. I wanted to be a father, actually. Wow. Yeah. And those are the only things I could say with 100% certainty. Mm. And I, I don't know why, but I, that's what I wanted when I was a kid, too. When did you realize that Mel was the person that you wanted to marry? Oh, man, that's frightening, right? That question. Yeah. Because in a lot of ways, I think I idolized this idea of partnership, right. of what Wife. marriage could look like. Yeah. And what if we could be, uh, who's like a Jay-Z Beyonce? Like, what would that look like, right? It wasn't when we started dating. It was once I started thinking about marriage, it was terrifying because I was like, oh, what if I make a mistake? What if she's not the one? What if it's this person? What if I haven't met the person yet? What if I get married and the next month I meet someone else? And I was like riddled with all of these questions. It was pretty, pretty debilitating almost. And there's a book called The Meaning of Marriage, and it's essentially this book that's kind of like, what is the point of marriage? Why do we get married anyways? Mm. And it's pretty much just like an entire book that's like punching you in the face saying like, Jason, you're not special. You know, and I think it kind of goes back to what we were saying at the top of the podcast, which was when your whole worldview or your lens for marriage is, am I finding the right person? Did I find my, you know, Prince Charming or my Princess Charming? it kind of flips and it's like, who are you? And are you even that special that you would deserve that? Are you working on yourself? What are you bringing to the relationship? That I think is just as important, if not more important of a criteria for marriage than is this the right person for me? Mm. And so often we look at the person and say, ah, yes, it's him. It's her. She's perfect. And this is why. And let me just spoil alert. It's probably not true. That person is not perfect. And the reason is because they're not a perfect human being. There is no perfect human being. By the way, your criteria that you're using is not perfect. Everything that you think you're looking for will probably change. By the way, that person will probably change another five to 10 times in the course of your marriage. You know, So then it's like, okay, uh, totally reevaluating then the paradigm by which we think about marriage. And if that's the case, isn't it nice to find someone who's a partner who is willing to go on this journey with you of love and grace and that you're going to mess up, they're going to mess up, but who has, who shares that worldview, who shares those values, those principles, might that be more important sometimes? So it's not about finding the perfect person because they're not there, they don't exist and you're not perfect. It's about finding someone who is just committed to the journey you know, knock on wood, but we've had like a really happy and successful marriage. And I think hopefully if you called Mel, she would say the same thing. <laughs> she might be at home and like, ah, oh, like, I work. don't know. Like this sucks. You just launched an app all about dating and relationships and love. Why? We want to mm. change the way that people love. And the reason is because I would be as bold to say that right now, the way that people are trying to fall in love is broken. There is essentially like an epidemic of loneliness. It's much more difficult that we've seen for folks to have quality of time together, to date. Sex is down quite a bit. And loneliness is just a pervasive issue. We had launched a new YouTube channel called Nectar, where all of our flagship dating shows went, so like Versus One, T for Two, all of that. We just found, man, people not only love watching this content, mm -hmm. but they want to participate more. When we started to talk to them and survey our audience and start doing some research, we started to find all these problems with loneliness. And we said, okay, what would be the best solve for that? Why don't they just use whatever, Hinge or Bumble or Tinder? There was just a tremendous amount of dissatisfaction. Maybe there's something underlying below it, which mm. is folks have trouble knowing what it is that they're looking for. Mm. And they often don't even know who they are in a relationship or who they want to be in a relationship. So we said, okay, what if instead of building a dating app, we built a love personality test? When I, so I took the love personality test. Yeah, love print. The love print. Yeah. What and love, yeah. I'll share what I got. Okay. And so what I walked away with, so you've come up with four different categories. Yeah. The first one is around communication. Are you active? Are you less active and more reflexive? The second is partnership style. Are you more of a I person or a we person? Mm -hmm. Third is intimacy, physical versus emotional. And the fourth is how open you are, open versus vulnerable. Right. So I got active, I, physical, and guarded. 
Oh, interesting. Which surprised me. That is... But when I looked at it, I was basically in the middle for each one. Okay, you're pretty central. Yes, I'm pretty central what, on all of them. What color did that give you? Blueberry. Blueberry is pretty rare. I and feel special. I'll just pause you really quickly. The reason yeah. is because often when you're active, you are also open. Uh, so there's usually a correlation there. Or if you're more uh, reflective, then you might be more guarded. So it's actually really interesting to hear that you're... Uh, Active but guarded, yeah. Maybe, maybe I just talk a lot, but not much is coming out. <laughs> no, I think that, so the way we even came to these categories, so we actually spent six to nine months with a PhD researcher. Wow. Yeah, Dr. Marissa Cohen, she's brilliant. She's awesome. We essentially said, hey, when you look at relationships and what leads more to successful relationships and what leads mm. to less successful relationships. So we actually came up with an index of about 20 to 25 different categories initially. And we actually came and were able to whittle it down to the, the major four, to mm. these major four, which we included in Love Print. These are things that even if you're in a relationship, you've probably talked about a lot of these things. Yes. Inadvertently, right? 100%. So when I was first married to Mao, when we first got married, I found that I was way more of a we person than she was more of an I person. So mm. for example, if you were like, hey, come over, we're going to have a crazy party. I'd be like, yeah, Mel and I are going to definitely be there. Whereas when Mel would be invited to a party, sometimes she would be like, yeah, I'm definitely coming. Mm. And I'd be like, wait a second, do you not want me to be with you? And or if I'm like, yeah, Mel, you want to come, of course. And she's like, no, I, I don't necessarily want to go. It was like, oh, there's a, maybe a different way that we perceive what partnership looks like. And we had to have a lot of fights, conversations, difficulty initially. But we're like, what if there was a more objective or a tool or mechanism that we can use to actually like get to some of those answers faster? I love that too, because a lot of the current terminology we use, for example, love languages is a really yeah. well-known one. And yep. I've had many people ask me, hey, Eric, what's your love language? Yes. And I'm like, well, like, frankly, all of them. <laughs> right. And they're like, well, what should you care about the most? I'm like, probably the one I'm not getting right now. Yes. This feels a lot more precise. Now, my follow-up question is, when I initially looked at these, my judgy internal Asian American self was like, no, there's clearly a best love print archetype here to be the best partner. I was like, well, obviously from a communication style, you should be active and open instead of internal and reflexive. You Like, we... Thinking of us as a we sounds so much better than thinking of us as an I. You know, you say that, and I think naturally there may be some tags that you might be inclined to lean towards. The truth is we are all both of these things in some ways, right? But then it's like, what is more of your makeup? But even if you take like vulnerability, for example, yes, a lot of people, especially in the Western kind of mindset would be like, oh, vulnerability is so important. And I don't disagree with that. But we've also encountered those individuals or partners or been on a date with someone who first date, it's like a trauma dump. Let me just give you everything. Oh, yeah. They're crying and you're like, oh, cool. I'm like, it's awesome that you're so vulnerable, but maybe this is not the right circumstance or the place for it. So, yes. Is that, is that what you say during that moment in the day where you say, <laughs> uh, thank you, but uh, not appropriate? I just say, uh, check, please. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, so I think that that kind of demonstrates, uh, active and reflective is a good example too. Um, the example I always give is, you know, let's say hypothetically, you're driving to a apple orchard like two hours away with so your partner. Yes. And you have a disagreement at the apple orchard and you get back in the car and you're on your way back. Someone who is active is going to be like, we have to talk about this. Let's, mm. let's, let's talk about yeah. it. So then something's wrong. Let's fix it. And they don't know necessarily what they want to say, but they're like, let's walk through it. Someone who's reflective might say in the car, Jason, chill out. I don't want to talk about it right now. I need some time mm. to think about it. So I don't think that one is ever better than the other. And what we've also found is in different seasons, you actually appear in different ways. Wow. So it changes. And also with a partner, you might evolve. The thing that's also the most fun is, I don't know if you remember your relationship readiness score, but there's also yes, a number that I was that pretty comes high, up. by okay. the way. I'm very proud of that. But again, I was like, I want to make sure I'm a 10 and tell my girlfriend I'm a 10. Yeah. I mean, uh, 10 is pretty rare, actually. Okay. Um, but we have found, especially in the dating scene, that relationship readiness is really fun and really helpful. Mm -hmm. Because you could be a perfect match from a family and values and personality standpoint. But if you're a 10, meaning like, I want to get married and I'm looking for my husband or wife and I'm a one, which is like, I don't want a relationship. I'm just having a good time out here. Perfect matches will like, you know, wow. miss, right? It's like ships passing in the night. It's not the right time. It's not the right time. It's not the right season. And that number will change depending on where we're at in our life. There's this linguist 
skeptic concept out there called, I'm probably going to say it wrong, the Sapper-Horf hypothesis. Okay. And it states that language shapes thoughts. Language shapes reality. If you don't have a word for something, you're going to have a lot of trouble even thinking about what it is. So wow. when you described, you're creating a set of words and tools that people can now use to communicate with each other. That's like, wait, that's like potentially going to reshape culture. That is exactly what we hope to do. We initially discussed building a dating app straight up and launching a dating app. And we said, you know what? Even if we built a dating app with all of these different mechanisms that doesn't include swiping or that like eliminates some of like the bad behavior that we kind of see as pervasive on these apps, it won't matter unless we change the culture to your point of love and how do we think about love. Mm. So we said, you know what? Let's not launch a dating app. Let's actually launch a love personality test, which makes us introspective first. When we go out and we're looking and waiting for Prince Charming or the perfect girl. It's actually a lot harder because you're not going to somebody and saying, hey, I'll find you a partner through this app. You're saying, hey, why don't you learn how to understand yourself better and then to communicate that to other people? Yeah. And what's fun is already we've had people on the team who have people don't know that they work for Jubilee or that they're part of this app. And someone's been like, hey, what's your love print? And they're like, whoa, Ooh. it's already happening. It's like, oh, what is your re relationship readiness number? And also now we've added two additional assessments. So one is about boundaries and one is about family. So those are really fun to talk about. But we'll actually be able to see between you and myself, even compatibility, which is really interesting. So people obviously are like, wait, you guys are both in relationships. Why are you talking about compatibility? But what we found is that compatibility is really interesting, both from a romantic perspective, but also as a friendship pr perspective. Mm. Because we talk about I versus we. Mm -hmm. This happens very commonly among friends too, which is like, you're invited to a thing. Wait, Eric, why didn't you invite me to the thing? Yeah, it's like, do you not like me? Right. And then you don't want to have that conversation with your guy friend or your best girlfriend, but you're like, well, am I petty? I don't know. So we've just found that these tools actually can be helpful universally, whether in a romantic lens or not. But we're actually able to compute a compatibility score or percentage between every individual. Do you share that score itself? We do. Ooh. Yeah, I'll show you. Oh my gosh. It's showing a list of all your friends yeah. and how compatible you are with each. So this is where the fear part comes. Yeah. What if we do this? And like the score's low. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. shit, I guess we weren't good friends. Well, I think what would be worse, honestly, yeah. is let's say Mel and my wife and I took it and we're like 23%. Mm -hmm. What if you're 3%? What happens then? And it's so funny because I've talked, you know, we did so much testing. We were doing mm -hmm. a lot of beta testing. We were doing a lot of like longitudinal studies, a lot of like cross-referencing for, we wanted to make sure, we didn't want to serve people a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, you don't right? want to just come up with stuff. Yeah, it's not like, wow, Jason... What else would be fun to mess with people, right? It's That's not the point. It's like, we know that we could do that, but it's so much, it, it will be so much better and people will share it way more if it resonates and if it's real. Most fun class I ever took in college was called the psychology of relationships. Wow. And it was fun because 80% of lecture just ended up being we, the students, just raising our hand and be like, so like, professor, like, like hypothetically, if you like met this girl for coffee and she said he had a good time and you text her two days later and she didn't reply, like, should you text her again? Like, <laughs> like right now, what should I say? Yeah. Like, what does the case <laughs> literature recommend in this hypothetical case of which I'm very academically invested in? Yeah. And she, in it, she described there's a triangular theory of love that mm. like, hey, there's like three things that really matter. The first thing is passion, which is obviously, are you attracted to each other? Yep. The second thing is like intimacy, which very much like you can have intimacy in platonic friendships too. It's like, do you just get along with each other? To borrow a consulting term, do you pass the airport test? If you were just trapped at an airport, can you actually not hate each other? Right. And the third is commitment. Mm. And commitment is one that people often forget. In fact, many arranged marriages that seemingly lack the passion, and maybe even the intimacy, yeah. but on the whole, people are like, oh, this worked out it's because, you know, they just commit to each other. There's something there on the concept of, well, what makes it meaningful is that you both chose it to be meaningful. Like maybe, hey, perfection, what's that? But you've chosen to make the sacrosanct, you are the one yeah. to go on this journey with. And she has chosen this as well. And like that is what makes the bond as long as that stays. I think that that is a great foundation. Mm. I think that that should be the sustenance or the main meal of the relationship. It's funny because like, you know, I think without passion, it's hard to start a relationship, yeah. but to believe that that same level of passion is going to persist throughout your entire relationship 
is is unreasonable, right? And then it's like, oh, the magic is gone. The fire is gone. That's going to happen. You could be married to, insert what, Zendaya. I would argue or contend that yeah. your passion for them will ebb and flow. Um, but it's actually that I think commitment begets passion and more intimacy. I Well, this makes me think of two videos I saw from you, which again, describe the economy of what you do so well. The first one is like a very personal, intimate discussion, you and Mel yeah. during COVID, filmed around June, July, 2020. Yeah. And a question comes up and it says, have we been less intimate or less like immediate <laughs> passion during this? What do we say during that? And your answer was well, like, well, in some ways there's actually more because, you know, we're always touching each other because we see each other all the time. But like maybe that particular passion is yeah. less so because I'm seeing him every day as pajamas, which I thought was very funny and very honest. Yeah. And then the second video you did, it was on Jubilee where you had a lot of these very hot questions. And one of them talking about commitment was, would you ever stay with somebody who had cheated? Mm. Which again, goes to the different types of videos you make. And so I'm curious for you personally, not for Jubilee, is that a deal breaker? I think these hypotheticals are really important to discuss because it kind of shows us where our values lie. And I think that there was a point in time when I would say, oh, absolutely not. I would, I would mm. leave the relationship. But the truth is, I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. I think I, it would have to depend on the circumstances and what materialized. So in the same way that I think that I am the recipient of a lot of grace, I think it's like we all need to be shown a lot of grace. Mm. So hopefully we won't have to answer that question, right, right, of course but not. I'm not sure. Yeah. And y you know, you wish that you'd never have to find the answer to of some course. of these hypothetical questions with, you know, health, yeah. family, uh, unthinkable like dilemmas. You know what I tell people is like most good companies have a mission statement. Yes. And they also have a set of values that they choose. So for example, for Jubilee, ours is, our acronym is PAGER, but we, we care about people, authenticity, growth, excellence, and resilience. I actually think that in every relationship, you should also find a set of values mm. that you're mutually agreeing to for your relationship. But if you become a family, you're family now. So like Mel and I, we had like long conversation prior to getting married, which sounds like very corporate. It's not like we went on a corporate retreat or like anything. What are our shared values? <laughs> in our, what's our mission statement? Yeah, we made a video with corny music. No, Wait, did you actually? We did not. Oh, that would um, but we had a real conversation. And I was like, this is going to sound really corny and like really lame, but I think this might be really good for us. Yeah. What if we were to think about some different attributes in our relationship that are like, paramount mm. to our relationship and that one day if we have kids, which now we do, but when we have a kid that they will understand what our family is about. Yeah. It's developing the principles. Exactly. So I say that only to say that in an unspeakable, difficult scenario, that would be my North Star. fall on the principles. Yeah. Here's another fun hypothetical for you. Sure. What if you find someone you really, really like and you're ready to propose to them, but you go to their dad and they don't give you their blessing. <laughs> that hypothetical situation, there. how does one handle something like that? Yeah, it's shitty. it sucks. So that happened. Yes, yeah, you know, those are two competing principles actually for me because one is family. Family is like super important to me and respect, as I mentioned. So I respect my parents so much. And therefore I think my respect towards like parental unit was very important in getting Mel's parents' blessing, her father's blessing was really important to me. That said, living a life like true, that's like authentic to your feelings was also pretty important to me. And it was like, he said no, yet I have so much conviction now that I want to marry Mel. What does that look like? So it delayed my timeline for like six to 12 months. It's a long time. Yeah. I had this whole plan. I was like, oh, it's not happening now this way. I went to her mom and I asked her and she was like, yes, of course. I was like, okay. 50, 50, that feels 50 majority. Like that's, you could round 50% <laughs> up, like right. that's enough. And I said to myself, you know what? I don't want him to be surprised by if I propose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write him an email saying, not asking for permission, just stating what I intend to do. So that's what I did. Wow. The day before, no, the day of the proposal, I sent him an email, did not check my email for the rest of the day. And then when we called him saying, Hey, we're engaged. He was delighted. I don't know. It was, it was really interesting. I, I ask this because I think back to what you're trying to do, which is bring more love into the world, more ways for people to understand each other. And while it's not coming filtered through, this is Jason, like do what he does. It's coming from a team of people, a family, a company that ultimately is tied to you, Jason, the person. 
And so I'm fascinated when I ask you these like very hard questions to hear you like wrestle yeah. and ultimately give these very thoughtful answers. Like for me, knowing you more as a person makes me want to go back to my girlfriend and be like, okay, look, Nectar, <laughs> like we should sit down and do this yes. because the person behind it is thoughtful. And I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you said before, you said you don't want to be so represented on camera. How do you find that balance? Because also when I hear this from you, like on this podcast right now, I am like, oh yeah, like I want to, I want to do this more. It's something I actually struggle with sometimes mm. when I think about it. But I'll, I'll pause you really quickly. When you say, Jason, the person behind this app or behind Jubilee, and this might be the Asian part of it, where I'm like, uh, I don't want to like... But the truth is, it, it is not just me. It is mm. really our team is amazing and brilliant. Mm. And I think that the reason why they've come to work for Jubilee, I'd like to believe some of it is me because like I've got this cool vision and they really like me. They think I'm going to be a good boss, which hopefully I am. Um, but I think a lot of it is also because they understand the mission and the value system here. And they're like, oh, I can f with this. Mm. Whereas when, you know, when you work at a place where like, ah, the pay is good, but ugh, I don't know. Like, why am I doing this outside the pay? Yeah. Or... Um, I like my boss, but the work is meaningless to me. Yeah. We, I think, get the best people because not only are they brilliant and we're doing something brilliant, hopefully, but because they, with the mission mm. and they know that they're going to be respected here and that they're going to be able to make a huge contribution. It reminds me the type of leadership you espouse. So you embody, there's three, four general broad types. The first is hierarchical which is I'm your boss, yeah. which means I can reward you, I can punish you, et cetera. The second is knowledge-based. Like you follow me because I just know more than you do about the specific thing. The third, it's called referent. Mm. And it's really meant people look to you as like, this is someone that I want to be more like. And when you think about why people follow someone else, in some ways that's the most powerful. Where it's mm. not even like, oh, like Jason's my boss or Jason is paying me or like Jason knows more. It's not even like, oh, it has to be Jason. It's like, here's a mission Jason subscribes to. I believe in that mission too. I want to be more like, the closer I can be to this mission, the better. And like, you're the vessel for that. Yeah, if that's true, then I would be really honored because I think that's really a difficult thing to do. It, yeah. You know, it's so difficult to build a company. Yep. And it's so difficult to get everyone in a company to look in the same direction yeah. because we're so conditioned to look at ourselves. And yeah, obviously you should advocate for yourself. You should make sure you get the promotion or the bonus or the money or the salary that you're entitled to. But also if we all only operate under the myself principle, these companies are all going to fail too. You know, myself, I think all the people who work at Jubilee and have come through Jubilee, I think we're really fortunate because we have a lot of people who are interested in working at Jubilee. So we get to choose from like the best of the best and they make me better. They challenge me. The last thing I'll say is it also reminds me, there's a French philosopher who once said, if you want to get people to build boats, you don't pay them to gather wood and lumber and assemble. You try to inspire them with the endless immensity of the sea. Wow. I love that. The destination that we're going to. Exactly. Yeah. And for all of you watching, I hope you understand more why Jason's doing what he's doing and helping translate the love that you've experienced and shared with others and hoping that others get that same set of norms, tools, and words to do the same. If folks want to learn more about you or Loveprint, where, where should they go? Loveprint, we're now on uh, the iOS Apple Store. So just look up Nectar Love and please download, give us a five-star review. Uh, but I'm really excited because hopefully you just have a blast playing with it and exploring yeah. compatibility. And you can find me at Jason Wiley underscore everywhere. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you. That, that was, was it. Fun. Yeah, that was fun. Ooh, how do you feel? That was good. That was, I mean, that was, we went everywhere.